And with me tonight, a first appearance by James Brokenshire, Secretary of State for Housing, Communities and Local Government. He was previously Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. Labour's Shadow Attorney General, formerly Director of the Human Rights Group Liberty, Shami Chakrabarti. The leader of the SNP Group of MPs at Westminster, Ian Blackford. Jill Rutter, a former civil servant who's also worked for BP, is now a director at the Institute for Government. And the columnist for the Daily Telegraph, former editor of both The Telegraph, The Spectator and The Sunday Telegraph, Charles Moore. And, uh, and remember, as always, you can uh, argue from home. Our hashtag is BBCQT. We're on Twitter, Facebook, we're on Instagram. Uh, I suppose it comes as no surprise to say we have had a host of questions about Brexit. In fact, almost over half our questions tonight have been about Brexit. So let's plunge in at one of the key points with uh, a question from Susie Dutton, please. Will the deal be rejected? And if so, what will happen next? Will the deal be rejected, and if so, what will happen next? You are our government minister, James Brokenshire. What's going to happen next? Well, our focus is on ensuring that the deal is approved and that MPs support the deal the Prime Minister has, uh, has established, and actually how that is in the best interests of our country in providing certainty, stability, actually getting on with the job, which I think is what a lot of people are wanting to do. And actually see that we are getting on with that, that new deal, taking back control of our borders, our money, our laws, ensuring that we can trade around the globe positively. What so about these I 104 would... colleagues of yours who aren't going to vote with the Prime Minister, from what we know? Well, obviously, you know, I recognise the concerns that some of my colleagues have fairly and appropriately raised in relation to things like the Northern Ireland backstop. That's why the Prime Minister is talking to MPs in terms of how we can give that assurance to them as to the temporary nature of this backstop, how profoundly it does actually support our country moving forward, and therefore the need to ensure that we have that certainty. Because Why, if you sorry, don't, if sorry, you don't, if you don't vote against Why this... Why do you call you... it temporary when the advice that was um, dragged out from Geoffrey Cox is that the thing would endure indefinitely? Well, There, there are a number of reasons why it is temporary. If you actually look at some of the legal base under which this is being created, that underlines the temporary nature of what it is. The agreement itself underlines that. But it's also the political environment to this too. This is not something the EU itself would want to maintain for anything other than a temporary basis. It's not in their interest to do so. And therefore, we remain focused on those obligations on getting the conclusion of a deal by the end of December 2020 so that we're able to move forward positively for our country, outward-looking and ensuring right. that we have that bright, that positive simply, future. simply not true. And politicians, and I have to say the Prime Minister in particular, has got an obligation to tell the truth to people. And the Prime Minister stood up in Parliament earlier on this week and said it would be temporary. And yet, we know from the legal advice, where it states the following, international law and protocol would endure indefinitely. Now, there is a world of difference. Now, I got into trouble from the speaker yesterday because well, you're I stood yesterday. Lying, didn't you? I said when well, I said I, and because I had to be careful because of the way that Parliament works and I, and I and I, I did make the point that I did not believe the Prime Minister was being truthful I'm going to be quite specific tonight on the basis of what the law officers have told the government the Prime Minister is lying she has a responsibility to tell people the truth <laughs> and she has I'm sorry in that that's not right and that's not acceptable because the point is that this is temporary. The agreement says that it is temporary. No, the commitments cannot, of the cannot, parties underlines that too. Backstop. And as I've you indicated, and as, the, the as the Attorney when General said in his advice, how it is a, a question of the politics of this, how this profoundly does not reside in terms of the permanence of this and how we need to get on with that permanent arrangement, which is what All the right, political you haven't, declaration you haven't, okay, you haven't read okay, your own legal pause, advice. Pause for a second. simply wrong. Pause for a second. A lot of hands up. Jill Rutter, let's just hear your take on this. Just on the backstop, I think the really interesting thing is, yes, it's temporary, that's part of the language, but it could be indefinite. So what, what sort of you know, moves from being indefinite into temporary? That's to find a way out of the backstop. And the way you find you get out of the backstop is for it to be superseded by the UK's future trading relationship 
with the EU. And the really difficult thing is to say, actually, what is the landing zone uh, that would allow you to have a trading relationship with the EU that removes the need for the backstop? So the Prime Minister tried. That's what her checkers proposal, uh, people called it a deal, it was a proposal, tried to do. It tried to say, actually, what sort of relationship do we need with the EU that would remove the need for the backstop? The problem with the Chequers deal is the EU has made pretty clear it doesn't like the Chequers deal. Uh, the other things you could do, you could do a Norway Plus arrangement, that sort of arrangement people have been talking about, joining the single market and a customs union. You could decide to leave Northern Ireland behind. The EU has made it clear that it's very happy to countenance leaving Northern Ireland in that arrangement and GB going off into Canada. I mean, the or point is that if you don't have a... identical customs arrangements for the whole UK, then you have a problem with Northern Ireland if because there's a land border. So you need two sorts of things, you need three sorts of things, but you really need two sorts of things to avoid that. You need to be in a customs territory so you avoid being different customs areas and you need to avoid regulatory checks. That's the other thing that the EU insists on having between their single market yeah. and yeah. the third country. Understandably, what because the UK otherwise becomes. people smuggle across yeah. the border. So it's yeah. a question. We can get out of it if we can find a way to create that future trading relationship. Okay. Let's hear from one or two members of the audience, and then I'll come to you. Yes, you, sir, in the shirt in the second row there. You happy with the way things are going? No, I think as of this morning, there was 104 uh, Tory MPs yes. who said they can't support the, the government's view. Yes. So when are the government going to get real and accept that yeah. the, this isn't going to go through? Well, if you, if, you were the, if you were the Prime Minister, wouldn't you want to test the House of Commons and fight till the end and see how it worked out? No. Or would you start changing you things? What? I know but you're so not the Prime no Minister. There's no point in being Don Quixote and, and chart tilting at windmills. Let's, let's have something that will work. All right, and the woman in orange up there. I, I think my, my big issue is who can we actually believe? We keep hearing so many different opinions, and even tonight on the panel, you know, you, two independent people have, have both accused the other one of lying. Who is telling the truth and who can we believe? Do you want to hear from any more members of the panel? <laughs> <or they're all> <laughs> <laughs> Charles Moore. Well, thank you, David. And I think, it, uh, uh, by way of preface, I should say that um, it, I'm interested to hear what's already been said because, of course, one of the amazing things that the BBC manages in its unbiased approach is that here we are, f here we are five people on the panel and only one of them is pro-Brexit. That's me. And, uh, <laughs> and that's... Um, and, 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 that is a, and that is a very usual balance on the BBC. Jill but it's, but it's is not independent but, on this matter. But I'm sure we, she's against Brexit. Um, no, and, uh, no, Charles, absolutely I'm, I'm, not. We take no view on no, Brexit I, at I, all. I know James is a member of I know your, I know your, your I know your Brexit. Brexit. I know your Sorry, I know just before you yeah. attack the BBC in your perennial, even diurnal way, <laughs> James Brokenshire is part of a government that is pursuing Brexit. And I, I profoundly want us to ensure that we I'm leave sorry. on the 29th of March next year. That, that's absolutely yes, what, what our sorry, intention is. Sorry, what I mean is, is that, that, that everybody on this panel, except for me, comes from a Remain point of view in the referendum, and therefore, including James Brokenshire, yes. and therefore they don't understand why people care about this, and they don't see what the real issue at stake is. And this is why Mrs May's deal cannot possibly work, because that backstop, whatever is being argued, is permanent, mm. And, or potentially permanent, mm. and it is an annexation of part of our country. It, le it, it does exactly what Mrs May said she wouldn't allow, which is to put the part of the border of the United Kingdom down the Irish Sea, cutting off part of our country. It's, 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 it's absolutely way out of order, and it's not making us free to control our own borders uh, and make our own laws, which is... Uh, what she was talking about and promising all the time. So how could you possibly accept it if you believe in Brexit? And what... Well, the question was, and what will happen next, Charles? Well, I, I, I can't help the question, I'm afraid, and I, to be honest, I don't think anybody can, because it is so confusing and people are moving around so quickly about what they might be able to do and all the variations. So I feel that all one can talk about is what one ought to do and try to argue for that as clearly as possible. And while I think it is very, very important to try and get Brexit through in some sort of arrangement, it has to be an arrangement which actually is Brexit. And it seems to me that what's wrong with this deal is a lot of secondary things are wrong with it, like paying out all that money without necessarily getting anything in return. But there's only <coughs> one thing that's absolutely wrong, and that is the backstop, because we're stuck, we're caught. We're not going to be able to right. break up our uh, to, to break away and create our own trading relationship and have life after Brexit under this arrangement. Okay. So what is the point? Okay, I'll come to you in a moment, Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> um, lots of 
mem lots of members of Parliament are going to be downvoting this deal. I'd be interested to know what Labour's Brexit deal would look like. All right. So Shami Chakrabarti. Yeah. <laughs> so, so if I could go to the original question first and, 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 and then move to that. Will the deal be rejected? Obviously, we don't know for certain, but we got some very serious hints the other day, didn't we? And two pretty uh, major things happened. The first was shameful, which is that for the first time in this country's history, the government was found in contempt of Parliament. Right? That's like being in contempt of the law and the court. If, you, know, you don't get in your community to just ignore a binding order of a local magistrate, but Mrs May and her colleagues, forgive me, thought it was OK to ignore a binding vote in the House of Commons. Why? Because they wanted to hide the attorney's legal advice that explained the implications of the agreement, and in particular, and Charles is right about this as a matter of law rather than politics. You know, politics can come and go and change, and no. you can make all sorts of promises, but as a matter of law, the backstop takes you into a locked room and only the EU mm. holds the key. Jill Rutter, just on that point, Jill, I'll uh, come back to you. Jill, uh, as... In, in the Charles Mill, except as, as an independent witness, was there actually any big difference between what the Attorney General said in the House of Commons and what was finally revealed when he had to publish no, I his, mean, what, his advice to Cabinet? I think what was in his advice was actually what everybody who'd read the withdrawal agreement knew, and actually the House of Commons and the House of Lords aren't exactly short of lawyers who could read the agreement. And the Prime Minister, the week before, at a thing called the Liaison Committee, that meeting of all the committee chairs where she was grilled for a bit, and said there isn't a unilateral withdrawal clause. Everybody knew we couldn't unilaterally withdraw from that. Uh, the Attorney General put it in slightly more colourful language. You know, this thing about terms. indefinite, yeah. protracted things, and that's clearly why the government didn't want to release that advice and just offered the legal commentary, but it didn't add to the state of human wisdom particularly. And do you agree with Charles that actually th this is the breaking point, because if you go with, uh, if, you, if you don't have the same customs arrangement in Northern Ireland as you have in Britain, then you're cutting, you're making a division between Northern Ireland and Britain exactly. and you're breaking up yes, the, the union. Yes, the backstop... agree with that? The backstop definitely I hate this word, backstop. I wish we could call it a safety net. The, well. safety net. the Germans actually call it safety net. Safety That's net. what the German yes. word is for it. Yeah. Um, the insurance policy, if yeah. you like, yes. does effectively have a different regime. Northern Ireland would stay Hold in on. the single market or some elements of the single market mm. in long term. And I think the, the issue that I think Charles is absolutely right on, that I think is very strange, is Northern Ireland would find those rules being made for it in Brussels. The UK government wouldn't be there to argue for it. So it's a really interesting question of who would be arguing for it. It would still be under the ECJ. So I think, yes, it is and really there's a very right. I want to go back to Shannon, so she was halfway so, through. So, her so, so, to the answer the the, the lady about Labour, we wouldn't have all this problem with the backstop, etc., because we want the whole of the United Kingdom to be in a permanent customs union with the EU. So we wouldn't have the... We wouldn't have these... No, I, I know that some people mm. d d disagree with that, but it is an answer to the Northern Ireland question. We cherish, we cherish the Good Friday Agreement. It was, it was hard won and we will not, we will not have a hard border on the island of Ireland, nor will we keep kicking this can down the road with backstops and all the but rest Charlie, of it. It's which is part which is... of an answer to the Northern Ireland backstop because you also have to be in the single market. Yeah. Labour's got this sort of form of words about being in a strong relationship with the single market. You don't want freedom of movement. The EU has been pretty clear. Well, we want to that negotiate. We want to, we want and you to... don't want state aid rules, and that's the one You've thing they've right. very Jill, clear Forgive okay. me, and I've barely got two sentences out, but Sorry. it's all right. You know, go, go you your check. Charles complains, you complain. No, no, sorry, we mustn't I mean, complain. You, we, mustn't you, be, we mustn't complain, No, sorry. no, you, we, just, just, there's plenty of time. Can I... Can I, can I yes, I, he's, I been, I he's been trying to get in, I haven't too. addressed the question yet about whether the deal be rejected and what should we do, because, you know, I, I have a tremendous sense of sadness about the debate that's taking place in Parliament this week, that someone that's had the opportunity to, to work in Europe, and I think about future generations that are not going to have that opportunity... As a right, and I think what we do know from the government's analysis that every form of Brexit is going to make the UK poorer. There's so going what's going to happen? Less opportunity. Well, what's going to happen? I think, what I think will happen, David, is I think on Tuesday that Parliament will vote this down, and I think that Parliament will also vote to, to push through the the amendment that's come through from Hillary Benn. 
which will state that none of us wish to be in a situation where there's no deal. So in a sense, what will happen, because we've had a government which has failed to bring forward a, a plan that works, is that Parliament has to, if I can put it this way, take back control. So as the opposition in some respects, we're getting the ball. And it's up to us as to what okay. we do with that. I actually personally think, on the basis of the information that we now know, that it's far better to stay in the European Union than it is to leave. And if we have to, if we have to, go, back, if we have to go back to the people of the United Kingdom and ask them that question again, that's what we should do. Because quite simply, I would say to every member of Parliament, and this is irrespective of how people voted in 2016, if you go through the lobbies next Tuesday to vote this deal through, you're doing that fulsome in the knowledge that you're supporting a plan that is going to make people redundant. All right. People let, are let going me to hear from, all right. I, I want to hear from members of height of members of Lawrence, All right. Uh, in, the man in pink there up there, you, sir, the spectacles on. Shall Let's hear from well, two or three people, please, then we'll go on. Shami talks about things happening for the first time in history. For the, if this agreement was to go through, for the first time in our history, we would have a foreign power in control of our parliament. We would have a foreign power setting our taxes, making laws that we have no say on whatsoever. And I'm amazed that Prime Minister would put the people of this country in that position and to tell us that she's honouring the result of the referendum. What do you want to see happen yourself? I want to see happen what was put on that ballot form, which was a choice between remain in the EU or leave the EU. And my choice was to leave the EU. Mm. OK. And, and you, yeah. But was, was not the central argument to Brexit was that we already have a foreign power running our country, and now we're being told that this deal proposes that? I don't quite understand that. And to Shami, do you think that the Labour Party can renegotiate this deal by the 29th of March, or do you propose extending Article 50? Well, that's a tricky one, because the clock is ticking. So every time you, you, know, you, you, you get asked this question, you think, no, there's still time, because we've got a plan, and we don't, we don't have the same red lines that the Conservatives have. But I can't, I'm not going to keep kicking that can down the road. If, if we don't get resolution soon, if we don't have the general election that I think you should have when a Prime Minister is held in contempt and she can't get the central plank of her policy through the House of Commons, that's the people's vote that I prefer most of all, by the way, but if we, if we can't get into that driving seat soon, then I can't rule out um, having, to, having to extend um, the deadline so that we can, we can negotiate a better deal. Or revoke OK, the, the woman in the centre there, in, in purple, yes. Yes, you. Um, I'm sorry, but Shami, but I think that a, uh, an election uh, at this crucial time is just utterly self-serving. I think if you want to vote... <laughs> Sorry, what you she said was, was covered by applause. What was <laughs> your, just you say it again. If you want to go back to the people, the only way is, with, is a second referendum. If you do an election, they will punish Labour like they punished the Tories when Theresa May did the same thing two years ago. So that's just how I feel about it. Okay. And James Rutherford, the, the chairman of the 22 committee, a powerful man, Graham Brady, said today he wants the vote deferred. Not taken on Tuesday. No, well, that, that's, uh, that's not what we're going to do. We're in the midst of five days... Why don't you want to listen to him? He's well, got the ear we're, we're, of the Conservative. We're, we're in the midst of five days of uh, debate in relation to the uh, Brexit deal, and the vote is coming on Tuesday. But I, I, if I may, I did want to challenge uh, Shami's point in relation to the, uh, the, the assertion that she made about the contempt of Parliament. Mm. The reason why the government did not want to disclose the Attorney-General's advice was actually on the basis of the functioning of government. The government right. itself should be able to have advice in the same way that anybody in this audience is able to have advice from a lawyer to keep that confidential, effectively not show the other side all of your arguments. It's at that fundamental, which is why we did argue that but point. The most right. Not to cover embarrassment, but to do that. But because it is about how government but we, needs to Do operate. we really want to but go back on this? Because that's been decided. No, really You've important. revealed... It's well, really important. It's a point of most... constitutional importance. And that's huge but, importance Yeah, in but all we're of through this. that because and we're into a much bigger crisis now, which isn't to do with information given to the government, is it? In truth. Against each other, yeah, so they can't come. Up, they can't come up with a solution. They are mm. always but fighting. I can't let him get away with that because this is about parliamentary sovereignty, and that is the governing principle of the entire constitution. But whether you're for leave or yep. remain, that's what this is about. All right, and that's and that's why we recognise the, the votes that Parliament uh, made, and obviously we did and you provide. Ignored it uh, we, no, for we a provided month. All right, I'm going to close down that bit. Thank you very much indeed. You've made your points uh, um, succinctly and and.
with great clarity, but there are other points sure. about what happens next that are important. Ruth Murrells, let's have your question. Ruth. Isn't it time Labour and other MPs stop fantasising about getting a better Brexit deal and instead back a real deal on Tuesday? OK, this is... In other words, is this, is this as good as it gets? Um, well, who's going to take on that one? I'm going to come to you, James. We know what you think. Ian. Well, look, I, I think at the end of the day, every single member of Parliament has got a responsibility to their constituents. And we know from the analysis that's been provided by the UK government, by the Scottish government, by many others, that in all scenarios, that the economy would be poorer under Brexit than it would be under the status quo. And I think the responsibility that we've got as MPs is to be honest with all of you and say, OK, however you voted in that referendum in 2016, we now know of the price that's going to be paid. And quite simply, I don't believe that unemployment is a price worth paying. That's what happened under the Tories with Thatcher. And I'm not prepared to turn around people in Bishop Storford and in Scotland. Fraser of Allender have told us that on a no-deal scenario that 80,000 Scots could lose their jobs. They'd be £600 a year on average poorer. That is a disgrace that any government is prepared to sit back and allow that to happen. And they okay. do have to explain... <laughs> I'm saying to everybody, staying in is the best option. All right, mm -hmm. you, sir. The public has got inured to these projections of economic Armageddon. Mm -hmm. If there is no long stop to the backstop, then Theresa May's deal is dead. And there is a perfectly good solution, which is to leave on WTO terms, because, <laughs> because, because the whole objective of the WTO is to promote global frictionless free trade for the benefit can, of everyone. Can I say to you, sir? No, 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 Profoundly, it's better. And that, that's why, you know, I am advocating very firmly tonight why the Prime Minister deal is the right way forward, because otherwise you do get instability, you get uncertainty, you get division. And, and just to take on but Ian's Broken point, you know, he's, he was talking about uh, honesty. Well, it's interesting that from, uh, from the SNP's perspective, they want to turn their backs on the major market, which is the UK market. I agree. And the fact that that's four times the amount of trade that would happen to the rest of Europe. And, and actually, that's profoundly not in our union's interest. I'm a proud unionist and I stand for that and therefore what's in our UK's interest is getting behind the deal for the issues of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement too and it does come down to these issues of needing to ensure there is this frictionless border <coughs> on the island of Ireland for all that that has achieved in terms of peace uh, and stability. But Mr. Brent, Joe, Joe I want to come back to the uh, to the original question because I think what's really interesting about what happens next Tuesday is that this is the, supposed to be the meaningful vote. Parliament wrested the right to have that meaningful vote away from the government, which wasn't very keen about giving Parliament a say on the terms of the deal. But actually, it's really quite interesting, because if the Hillary Benn amendment passes, which Ian was talking about, MPs won't actually even vote on the Prime Minister's deal, because if that passes, they'll vote on that. Uh, so we won't know what they think but of the Prime Minister's deal. Joe, and what's if, really uh, interesting... One second, because this is important. If we back the Hillary Benn Amendment, the beginning Just of that amendment... Just tell us the Hillary Benn Amendment does, in ten words. It, it basically votes down the Prime Minister's deal and says that Parliament must not allow a no deal to happen. That's what it does, but and, it explicitly okay, back votes to you, down Joe. what the, what the government bringing really forward. And what's really interesting is there was another amendment that was passed on the yeah. government's sort of Black Tuesday when it lost all those votes. Dominic Green. It was a Tuesday, yeah. which is a Dominic Grieve Amendment, yeah. which basically said that rather than just take note of what the government mm -hmm. planned to do, Parliament could take control yes. and actually yeah. lay substantive amendments saying what should happen next. Yeah. But what's really interesting mm -hmm. is MPs could have put down substantive amendments to this motion this mm -hmm. time, perfectly entitled to put down motions asking for people's vote, asking for Norway Plus, but actually we're getting a lot of shadow boxing here because nobody wanted to put their head above the parapet because nobody, everybody knows they don't actually have a majority for an alternative yet. So we're in this really phony that's war stage quite, and the clock is... Right, 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 that's right, that's not quite no, true. Cha Charles yeah. Moore, well, do, that, to this, pick up this, on that point, nobody, this, nobody, has, nobody has a majority for any alternative. That, that would seem to be the case, but this discussion, I think, illustrates why it's very hard to answer the lady's earlier question about what's going to happen. Yeah. And I want to lift it a bit above that because I simply can't tell you I don't believe anybody else can. And I want to come back to what Ian's talking about. Because he's saying that there has to be uh, what so-called people's vote, a second referendum. And I just want people to think about what that means yeah. um, in terms of how the public will see 
the attitude of politicians to what they did when they voted yeah. in the referendum. Um, yeah. I, to, to be a Remainer is a totally respectable point of view. A great many millions of people believe it. Um, it it's it's an absolutely legitimate view. But I really think it's not a legitimate view to promise the people that they can decide our future by a referendum and then to take it away. And the, and the, uh, 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 I'm afraid, that, I'm afraid that the people proposing a second referendum were often people who bitterly opposed the first one and always said how awful it was to ask the people and are now pretending they want a referendum for rhetorical reasons or they're trying to turn it all round again. It always happens on the continent when the referendums have often gone against the EU that they're made to vote again. That's what happens again. It happened in Ireland, it happened in... Why, uh, why do you think the public, with a right to vote again, would suddenly change their minds and vote remain I don't, rather than... Uh, no, no, I don't... Why are you frightened of no, no, a, of I'm a not second all, or no, third no, or fourth? No, vote? I'm not at all frightened of it. What I think is very, very bad is the attempt to get round what the public has already decided. We, yeah. we were promised it, uh, and that was the basis of it. Yeah. And, 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 and if, Charles, sorry, is it, is it, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm it, impartial on this, is it a point of principle to you that whatever the type of Brexit that comes up, the public should not have a second vote on that? Uh, I think that's right, because, because of the terms of the first Brexit. If, if you all vote because you've been told by the government and by Parliament, mm that this is going to decide it, it must decide it. Otherwise, you have a terrible conflict, which is what we're approaching now, in right. which the MPs are against the public. Shami Parliament is against the public, and that really seems to be a very dangerous situation. Shami Shakrabarti. Yeah. So, so perhaps Charles and I don't agree about all that much. However, <laughs> what, I, what I will say about a second vote, and I don't rule it out, because if we get to an on-pass where that's the only way, then we'll have to consider it. What I will say is, careful what you wish for, because what if we get something that's almost the same, a little bit one way, a little bit the other? We still have a fundamentally split country. And then what happens next? Best of three? Best of five? Are we constantly riven in this way and unable to move forward on tackling poverty and inequality and, and dealing with all sorts of enormous 21st century challenges? Now, as I said, I can't rule it out, but I favour the people's vote that's called the general election. Theresa May made promises to unite this country. She singularly failed. She can't get her deal through Parliament. We really do need to consider Shami, the old-fashioned uh, democratic Shami, principle we, we, of the Prime I, Minister uh, um, resigns and we have a general let election, me just, I think. Yeah. But, but Jeremy Corbyn said today, um, in an um, article for The Guardian, uh, that if Labour can't force an election and the deal fails, then he, there must be the option of campaigning for a public vote to break Absolutely the deadlock. Now, he's be. not said that before quite as clearly. And it sounds to me as though Labour is moving towards saying... Because nobody, you know, yeah, everyone, there's no way you can get a general everybody election Everybody wants to say fingers, we've been moving this way and that with a... The, Are you not? The, Hold on a second, I'll come to you. Don't shut out, I'll come to you. Uh, we, we, we made our policy at a massive party conference mm and we haven't shifted in that policy. If, if, if we can't support her deal and it gets voted down in Parliament, our preference would be for a general election, but if we can't control that, not least because of this, fixed, this outrageous fixed-term Parliament right. Act. So if, right. if there's no other way to break the on pass, we can't rule out supporting another public vote. All right, go on then. We were played by Farage. We need to look at the reasons why we thought about Brexit, and that's because we have a divided country. Two of the things that were mentioned were taking back control. We've already sold everything off to foreign people, um, and also immigration. And the reason why immigration was a problem was because it wasn't carefully thought through and because we don't have enough good training systems for our own people and our productivity is much lower than other competitive countries. And so we rely on cheap labour to boost it up. We, you can argue all these elegant arguments for as long as you like, but you need to deal with the real problem, which is we are a divided country. There's too much disparity. OK, and you sit here. I think we all agree that it's a bad deal, I think, for different reasons. Yeah. Uh, and by Theresa May's own words, no deal's better than the bad deal. We don't seem to be going down that route. What we seem to be doing is, rather than leaving the EU, we seem to be rejoining it in a different way. In a worse way. <laughs> with, no. less, with less control. And you sat there in the... Yes. <laughs> um, the, the, the problem with the initial referendum 
was that, you know, we were not given all the truthful information. Uh, particularly, we were pr promised 3.5 million by Boris Johnson for the NHS, and that simply disappeared. So, and also, my other point is, you know, democracy doesn't mean listening to the 53 percent that voted Brexit, but, you know, what about the 48 percent who wanted to remain? I mean, do they not, uh, do their voice not get heard? How would you... How, and how would you have their voice heard? I'll come to you up there. How would you have their voice heard? How would you have their voice heard? Well, by giving, going if back to lost. a second, people's vote. Mm. Oh. What another vote? Okay. Yeah. The, vote. And the woman up there on the... On the yes, you may. I think the, the point of having a I second people's up. vote mm. would be that we can vote on what's proposed. It's not the same question that we voted on the first time around. It's, it's to assess what, what the actual plan would be, the, pe the people's opinion on that, not just on leaving the... Yeah. But, 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 uh, sorry to put it like this, but do you know what's proposed? Because yeah. I don't. Yeah, exactly. Well, when we have a clear plan that's presented and approved by Parliament, if we get to that stage ever, then we definitely need to well, have people's Well, that's the problem, isn't it? Because, it? because mm. Parliament may not support it, you know, what Theresa May is currently putting to them for the reasons that we've all been It's interesting, expressing. because com coming back to sort of the original question was the fact that we do have a deal on the table and, and the somehow that... If you can say to the EU, well, we're just going to renegotiate completely. I just do not see that happening. And indeed, if you open the withdrawal agreement up, then I think you're likely to go backwards rather than forwards. You... And therefore, there is the certainty of a deal that we have that, that actually does promote trade, does ensure that we do deal with the issues over immigration by ending free movement, one of the critical issues that people voted on. And that's why, actually, if you do analyse the deal, if you do look at it, I think it sets out a positive way forward. And by the way, we but, don't need but, to get but, into but the back. Stop because we can actually get this deal negotiated, or if needs be, have that sovereign choice of extending the transitional but, period, and okay, therefore I want, that's what it delivers. But what we have just to just on, pause for a moment. Just pause for a moment. I want to I want to take a question from Cindy Fry, please. Cindy Fry, let's have your question. Should the Prime Minister resign if a Brexit deal is voted down by Parliament? Should the Prime Minister resign if her deal is voted down by Parliament? Charles Moore. I wouldn't say she obviously must, um, but obviously if she loses, she would have to uh, come up with something which reflected the opinion and she would have to try and go back to Brussels and she might well fail. And when, when her efforts are finally exhausted, if they do fail, she would have to resign because you can't go on... If you attach yourself to a policy and you just... The great policy of the time and you just can't do it, you have to go. But yep. I, don't, I don't think yep. it needs to get to that, as a matter of fact, because if only she stood by her thing that no deal is better than a bad deal, she's got something she can do. But, in fact, she's... Um, uh, she, I'm afraid she's just reversed that. She now thinks a bad deal is better than no deal, and she's not... Uh, and she's... We're running out of time, and actually, if I, I really do think this is disgraceful, because the government... One thing the government's known in all this, only but one thing it's known, is it's known for nearly two years, the exact date when exactly. we're leaving. Exactly. Why aren't we ready? Exactly. Now, why haven't we... What, what, what's going on? Um, uh, 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 OK. It, it's, it, it's talking I, itself out of a solution. I think, yeah. I, think, I think the fundamental issue here is we have chaos, and Charles is right, the government's had two and a half years to come up with something and it hasn't managed to do it. Yes, yeah. And I think the Prime Minister has to take responsibility for that. I actually I, I agree with Shaki that we should be having a, an election because it's a government that's failed. You know, this government lost three votes in two hours this week. That hasn't happened for 40 years. It last happened under Jim Callaghan. The Prime Minister has lost the confidence of the House. Parliament needs to fix that. And by the way, what I would also do is because we now know from the European Court of Justice, from the, from the Advocate General, that it's likely that we know that Parliament can revoke Article 50. Let's take this right. off the table the, for the, now. The woman there. Bearing in mind that the referendum, referendum was set by David Cameron, it didn't go the way that he wanted. He left as soon as he got the result. Is this likely that Theresa May is going to do exactly the you same? Think, do you think she should or do you think she should stick? Ah. I think it would be refreshing if she stuck to her guns. And what? Yeah. And, and did, as Charles said, the, uh, um, no deal is better than a bad deal and went for no deal? Very likely. That's what you'd like. But I'm disappointed that uh, the government does not seem to have been pre-planned when this could have been decided and worked on two years ago. We, we talk about this planning. Jill, let me, let me put a question to you, you uh, as an observer of this. Do you think the government was too hasty to uh, invoke Article 50? And do you think, once having invoked it, they should have done more discussion within 
among the political class of all parties about the way it was going to go rather than do it I just think, I herself? Think, I think yes to both, own. actually. I think uh, there was big pressure. I mean, people thought the Prime Minister was really dragging her feet a bit. You know, remember that both David Cameron and Jerry Corwin said you trigger Article 50 the day, the day after, after Jeremy Corbyn uh, which would have been absolutely ridiculous as we now... Yeah realised to do that. So I think uh, at the time the Prime Minister seemed to be kicking it off into the middle distance but it's now clear that uh, we didn't actually do the due diligence and nor did Parliament frankly on what was entailed in doing the necessary preparation to be ready to strengthen our negotiating hand with the EU. We've suffered all along from this imbalance of negotiating power uh, and being readier for no deal would have potentially uh, changed that balance but uh, preparing for no deal if you actually think you're going to get a deal and actually you're going to have quite a close relationship with the EU going forward means, frankly, wasting a huge amount of public money. That's the problem with no deal preparations, is you have to spend lots of money on new IT systems, setting up new processes, new regulatory agencies. For example, the government's created a thing which they've recru started recruiting people for, they've got premises in Reading, called the Trade Remedies Authority. Mm. We use that if and when we run our own trade defence policy, but we don't run it as from 30th March 2019, because we're in transition if we get a deal. We don't potentially run it for another two years if we prolong Jill. transition. We don't ever run it if we so, stay in a customs but, union. But, but Jill, I'm sure, you're, I'm sure you're right, Jill, that it's quite expensive to prepare properly, properly but it's certainly not anything like as expensive as £39 billion, which we're paying for... No, that's... Sorry, can, can we don't have to pay Jill, that? What, what, do, you, what do you think um, is going to happen? I'll yeah. come to you up there in a moment. Jill, on the what do you think is going to happen? On the Prime Minister, where yes. the Prime Minister should go. I think the Prime Minister will need to reflect on whether she is actually the right person to create a sort of different sort of consensus about where to go. If it's clear that she can't get Parliament to support her deal, which I think she thinks is uh, the sort of best available Brexit given her red lines, uh, her sort of Brexit, maybe not Charles's sort of Brexit, uh, then I think the Prime Minister needs to reflect. If you need somebody who's sort of agile, maybe a new face with the EU, maybe somebody who can create some sort of cross-party consensus. The Prime Minister had two opportunities when she could have reached out to other parties. First, when she became Prime Minister, and second, when she got that sort of slap in the face in the general election. She could have said, this is actually something that's bigger than one party. We need something that will unite a very divided country, and it will unite... You're up there. Can I just ask for those supporters of a second referendum, what would be the point of wasting valuable time which we could be using, saving our NHS, finalising Brexit and supporting our education services? And what would you have happen? I would like to pump more money into the NHS yeah. so that we can have more beds for those people who need it rather than having people waiting in... Uh, and what would you do about Brexit? I would like to support the current Prime Minister and her deal and get that finalised. Yeah. OK, fine. And go with it. And do you think the Prime Minister should resign if she doesn't get this She's through? got to get a deal through the House of Commons. Now, if she doesn't succeed on Tuesday, she can... Um, now there is the possibility for her to get some guidance from the House of Commons on what to do next because, because of the Dominic Grieve mm. Amendment in particular. But in the end, this is a parliamentary democracy. This is not a dictatorship. This is not a one-woman show. She can't say it's my way or the highway. It's not how it works right. in this I'm, country. I, I, just before we... I'm going to go on to some other questions. We haven't got that much well, time. But let me just hear from one or two other people and I'll come back yeah. to you. Um, you've spoken already. You're at the very back there. I, I agree with Charles Moore about this, but what I don't understand is why they actually thought they were going to get a good deal with Europe. They have done everything they can in every which way. We've been bullied, we've been spoken to really badly, and I wasn't sure which way to go. But after listening to what Barney has said and all the other things, I don't really want to be part of a club that doesn't is going to be rude and, and not give me what's fair. All right. Um, the person in the, in the, the man in the very middle in the back row with spectacles, you, sir. The vote for Brexit was a vote to bring power back from the EU to Parliament. Now, we've made that decision, and this withdrawal agreement is your first opportunity to prove to us that you have the ability to exercise the power Leave voters chose to give to you. Now, if that means you have to go cross-party, then I think you need to think about doing it. Because at the moment, we're at an impasse. 
And we J need to move forward. What do you, James Brokenshire, do you think there's a chance of a cross-party uh, well, set up coming out I, of this? I wanted to come... Because you've to... got some supporters in the Labour Party, yeah, haven't I, you, for your I, I, I wanted to sort of come back to the, the primary question on the Prime Minister. And I don't think... Whatever you may think about the deal, I don't think anybody would say that the Prime Minister has not earnestly sought to act in the national interest, in her judgment, and actually to put the huge amount of effort, the energy that she has shown, and the resilience to get the best deal for this country. And, I, you know, I, I absolutely hear the point that was made a little bit earlier on about focusing on investment in our NHS, getting on with the other priorities. And, and that's actually the choice that parliamentarians have, of whatever stripe that there is a deal that is on the table that does deliver our departure from the EU next March, that actually therefore does allow Parliament to start making the laws and exercise some of that sovereignty. And therefore, I think, you know, everyone has got to look very carefully, calmly and coldly about the choice that's there that will allow our country to move on, and I hope that people will take that deal and allow our country to do so. The Prime Minister hasn't sought to work with people, and in particular, she hasn't worked with the devolved administrations. Yeah. The Scottish Government has put compromise document well, in front of the UK Government, one after the other. There's been no respect shown to the Scottish Parliament that voted yesterday against Brexit on a cross-party basis. Westminster hasn't accepted that Scotland but, voted to remain, and our rights are being but, disrespected. But Ian, you, you want Scotland Prime to remain Minister. in the European Union. This was a this was a referendum for the whole of our United we Kingdom. Told, and we, we certainly we were told, have James, sought to we work very closely with And you get the same problem as we Northern told, Ireland if you stay in, yes, don't you? We were, we were, I mean, you have well, to be independent to get to... Well, other, otherwise, you've got to have a border well, between... That. We, we you have to have a border between Britain. We were told in 2014, if we stayed in the UK, that our rights as EU citizens would be respected. And now the UK wants to take us out against but, our will. The yeah. problem with the Northern Ireland situation, and I'm very conscious of the Good Friday Agreement, mm. we must all support that, yes. but the fact is that Northern Ireland is getting a better deal. Northern Ireland becomes a destination in Europe, and that's to the disadvantage of Scotland. We can't have that. If the only way that we can protect Scotland's interests by being independent, then I'll tell you now, that's exactly what we'll be doing. Right, well... You think you, you get you you want it? No, you're one 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 clap. There you go. Even in Bishop the Stortford. Yeah, well. Bishop, well, the sound of one hand clapping, I think it would be called. That. Anyway, uh, I think we might move on now to uh, another question. Let's take uh, this one, Emma Bateman. Let's have your question and change the subject completely. Yeah. Emma Bateman. Uh, David Attenborough warned that climate change was one of the biggest threats to humanity. I'm 16 years old and I can see these changes and effects. Why aren't politicians doing enough? Why aren't politicians doing enough? <laughs> And David Attenborough was speaking at the uh, UN Climate Change and talking about the collapse of civilizations, the mm. extinction of much of the natural world is on the horizon. Why aren't politicians doing more? Charles Moore, why aren't politicians doing more about it? Well, politicians are doing a lot, and I think most of the things they're doing are wrong. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and I think that, um, uh, that though climate change is a serious issue, I think that a lot of assumptions are made about the damage it will do which are not proved. And I think that a lot of uh, dangerous things are being done in the name of climate change. And you can see right now going on in France, and it's, and it's something comparable has happened here and in many other Western countries, where ordinary people are paying an awful, awful lot for utilities, petrol, electricity, um, because they're being, having levies imposed upon them on the idea that somehow this is going to stop the world getting too hot. It's not going to stop the world getting too hot, but it is going to make a lot of people much poorer than they need to be. And it bears very heavily on ordinary people for whom these costs are much bigger relatively than they are for well-off people. Why is it not and going to stop the world getting hotter? Well, because... It, Isn't that the whole point of... Uh... Fundamentally, because the whole idea of, uh, in behind the Paris treaties that uh, we all get together to stop this doesn't work at all, because masses of the participating countries don't actually do it. Uh, and anyway, the United States have withdrawn now, but, you know, China, China continues to produce absolutely enormous amounts of carbon. And so all this enormous, complicated uh, international apparatus, which always says, you know, 10 days left to save the planet before every one of their conferences, never achieves anything except putting more costs on ordinary taxpayers. Joe Russell. So I think we really need to look at this. Okay. Joe Russell. So before I joined the Institute for Government, I used to work on sustainable development at the Department for Environment, uh, Food and Rural Affairs. And so this used to be... Absolutely, we do it. What we did, I mean, I was there when we did the uh, Climate Change Act, which I thought was necessary, the sort of best idea. But anyway, so we uh, led the way. I think why politicians don't act is precisely for the sort of reasons that Charles has just set out, that they are really worried that the sort of measures that they think 
are needed to reduce energy use, uh, cut carbon emissions, will not go down very well with the public. So it's quite interesting that sort of President Macron is experiencing that at the moment. He has you know, got huge ambitions for the Paris Climate Accord, but has actually put through really quite a modest fuel duty increase. Our government's frozen fuel duty since uh, 2010. That's actually cost... Um, Oh, lost revenues are about sort of six, seven billion pounds that could have gone to the NHS. But Charles is sceptical about the premise. That Charles the, the, is sceptical. Places... I think Charles is. There is a sort of very interesting group of people who are sceptical about the science. There is a big scientific consensus. There's quite. Uh, so I think I would tend to go with the scientific consensus. I think if you look at what is happening to the climate, we are seeing. You can't look at one climate event and say that's because of climate change, but there is definitely appears to be a pattern of much higher temperatures, a pattern of much more volatility in the weather, more, uh, more intense rain, more wildfires, even in Saddleworth, more this summer. So I think we do need to have action, but I think politicians are very nervous about making people do things that they are unwilling to do. So there is a sort of degree of political cowardice there about taking a lead on this. And for the UK government, while it's so preoccupied with Brexit, Everything else is being completely crowded out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, yeah, it's been, been touched on that tax, um, that fuel price is going up, fuel tax is going up. How about train train fares? It's well known Absolutely. it's the greenest method of public transport, and the price has gone up three and a half percent in yeah. January. Mm -hmm. Up and up and up, and the service is mm. terrible. So where's the incentive for people to exactly. take the greenest method of transport? Right. To, to go back to the original question from Emma, you know, why aren't politicians doing enough? Doing enough. Some of them are in denial, and some of them are just downright selfish, because they're not caring for future generations. They're thinking about short-term advantage, and, and a lot of the people that vote are a bit older, and they're not necessarily thinking about your generation either. Charles... Charles... Charles called this a serious issue. This is not a serious issue. This is potentially an impending man-made catastrophe. Um, where he is right, though, where he is right, though, is to is, is that we should be warned by uh, what's his name, Jupiter, President Macron. Okay, <laughs> it's you cannot tackle climate change without spreading the burden. You can't expect the poorest people in the world or in your country to pick up the burden. It's got to be shared fairly, including by the richest countries and the richest multinationals who have been scooping up the benefits of all of this. Okay. Emma, Emma, what do you think? Well, then, surely, shouldn't we be putting more pressure on countries like America Absolutely. and China yes. to Absolutely. then get those like policies through? Because Absolutely. they're the main problem. Absolutely. And so, yeah... It should be done. But what do you make of what's been said here about politicians being nervous because of getting a public well, reaction there against isn't, there isn't you know, enough petrol time. prices going up, as we saw in, yeah, in there, France? There isn't enough time to be nervous. There isn't no, enough isn't. time for that. You should just get to it, maybe do a poll, maybe do something, at least, just to get it started. You can't just stay nervous. Charles, can you answer? One of the things that makes me sceptical about a lot of climate change talk is that people keep predicting catastrophe and then changing the prediction about when it's going to happen. So Prince Charles said about 10 years ago, we have 100 months left before irretrievable climate collapse. That was his phrase. And that was two years ago that the 100 months ran out. And we haven't had irretrievable climate collapse. And we keep on being told, and now we've just got the time or we're running out of time. What is true about this? I honestly think it's very, very hard to work out what's true because it has so many different imponderables in it. And therefore, I'm so sceptical of a, I do think a lot of people who are obsessed with climate change have a sort of um, a project fear, and they're trying to make us they're trying to make us do things because it's, everything's about to collapse. It's a problem, but the human race is very adaptable. And if we were to if we were to destroy our productive economies, we would all become much poorer and more miserable. And the word energy which is the key to all of this, is the absolute key to the so, prosperity and opportunity of society. So David Attenborough or Charles Moore, let's have a people's vote. <laughs> you decide. <laughs> in, in Blackford, I come to you, gentlemen. In. We are simply custodians of this planet for a short time and we have a responsibility to future generations. And I, I have to say I'm frankly appalled by what Charles is saying. We need to make sure 
that we cut our carbon emissions mm. and there is no time. We have to act quickly. This is a devolved matter in Scotland and I'm glad to say that the Scottish Government has led the way uh, across Western Europe. We have cut our emissions by almost, well, almost half since 1990 and we have a target by 2050 of being carbon neutral. Yes. We cannot step away from this. This is the most important thing that we need to be okay. challenging. And, and the woman there in the back. Yeah. Yeah. Surely, Charles, it doesn't matter if it's 100 months or 100 years. We need to get on with it now. Would you agree with Charles? That it's there not, are, there that, are, there that are, the are many things that, that, that Charles and I uh, will agree on, but on this, I don't agree with you. That I think there is a real imperative to act here. Yes, as a country, I think that we can actually be proud of a number of the things that we have already done. How we have the strongest less, uh, that's the strongest record in the G7. We're actually, getting economic growth, but actually cutting our carbon emissions. But I, for one, know that we need to do more. How we must move to a situation where it is a zero carbon environment, where we do ensure that, as we are, that we're, in, we're investing more in renewable energy, new technology that ensures that we are conservers in that way that Ian, I think, rightly highlighted. Because it is right, we need to look at the generations to come. And this is, as Sir David Attenborough said, I think one of those defining issues Absolutely. that we all have that responsibility for the future and why, as a government, we are absolutely determined to act and take this forward with our policies in relation to the environment and sustainability for all that it matters for okay. our country and the world. All right. We've got five minutes left. I'm going to take a completely different question just to end on from Katrina Ray, and we'll go quickly around the panel and the audience with it. Katrina, let's have your question. Does the panel agree with the Met police officers knocking into suspected moped criminals, knocking them off their bikes during high-speed pursuits? Tactical contact, they call it, and it's been used apparently 63 times since October last year. And uh, when people on mopeds are stealing uh, iPhones and bags and all sorts of things, they have this policy of knocking them off their bikes. Um, what do you think of that? Uh, what's, what's the Scottish view on knocking people off their bikes? <laughs> well, we don't, we don't, we don't Briefly, have a, if you would. We don't have a policy of knocking people off their bikes. You know, I think one of the issues here is that police numbers in England and Wales have mm. gone down quite substantially. Uh, whilst in Scotland they've actually increased. You need to have enough police on the beat yeah. in order you can deal with crime effectively. Yeah. And that's the issue. But the, um, the, the, the level of these, of these crimes has fallen since the you have to have publicity was given anyway. It has to be effective policing. I'm slightly nervous about using aggressive tactics. Shama Shakrabarti. Look, we have a doctrine of, of, of reasonable force. You can use reasonable force under the law to, um, to, to, to prevent crime and, to, and to catch criminals, but I'm really, really worried about this. I think it could... All it would take is for, for it to go horribly wrong in one case, and then the pendulum of popular opinion will, will swing the other way. So, is it legal what they're doing? Um, uh, possibly not all the time. I think it's very, very borderline, because what, we, what you've got to make it... Re, uh, to make it legal is this doctrine of using reasonable force and is it reasonable in every case when they're doing it is it proportionate when it's a mobile phone theft i don't as i say all it would take is one case to go horribly wrong mm. and uh, this, this this can't be a long-term solution to the terrible austerity that's facing policing okay. in this country you start there and then i come to you Adam. yes so quickly, nothing they've done so far has really been effective at deterring moped crime until they've started doing this if this is an effective deterrent and it can be with inside of the law, let's crack on. I'm appalled. I'm appalled. When I first saw the videos, I thought, good, they do something about it. But actually, if you watch those videos with the controlled car going straight into these moped, they are suspected suspects. Mm. They're suspected. Quite. We don't know that they've actually committed a crime, exactly. but I think the bodily harm that we're seeing, I think it's appalling, actually, that we should authorise our police to okay. do this. And I understand there are a couple of, probably, over the past year, times when the police have been taken to task about this. James Where Rockenshire. the authority comes from, I don't know. James Rockenshire, can you answer? Yeah. Uh, David, I, I think that... It's worth looking at the context, context of this, which is where so many of these people who are involved in moped crime, for a time, 
thought they could just get away with it, that they were untouchable, that they were beyond the law as a consequence of actually getting on one of these mopeds, having stolen from somebody, and the victimisation that that brings about with it. So I say I support the police. I support the tactical <laughs> approach. Put your money where your mouth is. Yes. 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 This needs to be done, yes, properly, to trust their judgment, and I certainly do, because Put I think that's the way... Is. That is the way that we ensure that we're really showing that we're on the side of the law-abiding, on the side of the victims, and, those, and against those who are actually committing the All crimes. Right. Jill Rutter. Um, I'm rather share the view, I think, of the lady over there, that this is... Uh, we're always worried about sort of trigger-happy policemen and looking at sort of states and things like that. This is a sort of different version of that. Uh, you should just think, you know, are you absolutely sure that person committed a moped crime? Oh. If you're actually doing something where you risk, you know, maiming somebody for life... I know moped crime is really bad. Um, I think I'm going to say, I think the police should think and say, is there a third way we can do this, where we can check them, where we can do something else? Because doing this in the long term is just going to make our streets even more feral. OK. Charles Moore, briefly, if you will. Um, I've actually got nothing to add to what was just said. Can I, say, right. something, can I say something completely different? <laughs> which is, you say goodbye. At, at this time... <laughs> yeah, well, oh, that's in a way, because at this time of great constitutional instability, when we all feel very uncomfortable, as we've been talking today, we do value continuity. And the only two things that are really have continuity in this country are Her Majesty the Queen and David Dimbleby. And, Quite right. And... <laughs> I, 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 I'm so old that I even be appeared on this programme before David ran it, with, yeah. with Robin Day, some of you will remember. Uh, and I think David's been a fantastic chairman, I shall be very, very sad that yeah. we yeah. won't be seeing him anymore. Yeah. Well, that's very... <laughs> and uh, and, you're, and you're... Your, your, your views on knocking people off mopeds will be forever <laughs> hidden <laughs> from public view. Shame. Thank you, and you don't Shame. need to suck up to me because I'm not going to do this with you well. again. Anyway, thank you for coming. <laughs> so our time's up. Uh, now, next Thursday is the last question time of this year. It comes from Southwark in South London. At the moment, we have the comedian and broadcaster Joe Brand with us. We may indeed have David Davis with us. I'm not entirely sure at the moment. But call 0330 if you'd like to be either uh, in that, in that, uh, that programme. Or you can go to the Question Time website. It's on the screen now. And follow the instructions. And if you want to have your say on what we've been talking about here, Brexit in particular, you can join Adrian Childs and his guests on Question Time Extra Time. That's on BBC Five Live right now. But my thanks to all our panellists, to all of you who came here to Bishop Stortford to take part in this programme. And until next Thursday from Question Time, good night. Andrew Marr keeps the examination of the week's talking points going Sunday morning at 10 on BBC One.